push these. Is that what he's? Stick a little further. Uh, did he say go to red? Excellent. Okay. Too late now. Okay, he's going to turn this off now. You ready? We're ready. <coughs> not making well, we have a pointer now. It's frozen. It's not working again. Push the button again. Just the circle button? The top button. Right. You just have to shoot it down for a second. All right, let's go. You can call this meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Cameron, I understand you're going to welcome us. Yep, yeah, thank you. I appreciate everybody coming out, having lunch with us, and to discuss uh, the charter amendments, proposed charter amendments, uh, and also talking about recreational marijuana tax. Uh, I want to kind of give a little bit of a background first to the charter amendments. So when I arrived in 2016, the charter in and of itself, which I believe is in the slide deck, was established in 2007. Historically, every... Uh, 10 years you would go through a uh, review of your charter basically your communities change the charter is the is actually the constitution of the city so it's voted it's it's voted on and approved uh, by the by the citizens and any changes into the charter require a vote by question uh, so you cannot just do one broad question to the to the to the voters uh, but in 2019 um, I brought I think it was nine amendments uh, just to bring it up to, to date in cer certain areas to make some changes uh, and I believe there was nine questions all of them passed but one and one of those was regarding the mayor pro tem's ability to vote three times or yeah twice mm. which was interesting because the the, 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 if the mayor is out and the mayor pro tem is seated and there's a tie the mayor pro tem actually had has two votes and so we were just trying to get that addressed but the voters turned that down and so uh, but there was a number of questions that are in here today. Some have been added from just staff um, working on this since 2019. But there was a number of other ones we wanted to bring in 2019 that we did not, just because there was a lot on that ballot. And then obviously the big one was after the uh, <coughs> constitutional amendment to recreational marijuana. I believe there's over 180 different counties. 187. 187 counties now that have passed some um, measure associated with this and we wanted to bring this before the the mayor and council the reason why we're doing it now um, is in the memo and the information that was presented was because in april we have a municipal election and the cost to do all that is about what nineteen thousand dollars and so adding the questions to the same ballot versus us what it would cost us to do it in august uh, or in november uh, basically this that's the reason why we're doing this now uh, what i what i'm going to ask is laura and megan our city attorney uh they've done the lion's share of the work on this with the staff uh, as i told them i said it, it, it's a priority the wastewater funding and the work that we're doing it, it, my time is allocated to that so they've done a fantastic job to prepare these slides and do this work and provide as many answers or ideas as they can this is being recorded for the community so any questions um, or comments that are made uh, i'll just refer people back to this video what we'd ask is to go through the entire slide deck and so that some people only have an hour today if there's additional questions or there, when there's questions we'll go back through the deck so that you can answer those questions but with that i'm going to turn it over to laura and megan thank you you have post-its at your seat so if you have questions feel free to jot them down so we can go over them after the slide is finished um, i'm available until almost two so i can answer questions as long as you need uh, David did a great job of going over the amendments that we did last time. I will admit that a couple of the changes that we're proposing are changing the proposals that we did last time. So we're trying to clean up some of the language on that. Um, I will go over, I will read the question to you, and then between the two of us, we'll explain what everything means. So for question one, shall the Charter of the City of Republic, section 4.4, subsection G, be amended and a new section 6.3 be added to change the city attorney position from a mayoral appointment to city administrator appointment, set forth minimum qualifications and duties of the city attorney, and set forth the term of employment for the city attorney. So Megan's going to cover this since she did most of that work. Okay, so really essentially what we have right now, and there's something in their packets that I prepared so that everybody could see this beforehand, but what we've seen um, mostly recently is sort of a trend with some of the larger cities and other just kind of offshoots throughout the state are moving towards making their city attorney position a, a city administrator manager appointment instead of a mayoral appointment. 
lot of different reasons for why, which I'm happy to go into individually, kind of just to streamline it today. <clears throat> but in our charter specifically, we have what I think are a few little holes when I started to look at this closely. Um, unlike a lot of other home rule charters, we don't actually have defining language in our charter that establishes the office of the city attorney or the actual legal department. It's relatively consistent with the departments otherwise in our charter, but since the legal department city attorney is a little bit of a niche area and it is referred to in a section as a term and that's it only ever, I think this is a good opportunity to set forth a few very basic provisions that establish the office, set forth minimum qualifications, which I put in my proposed language, three years practice experience, for example, that could be five, one, it's sort of all over the board, um, depending upon the state charter, the home rule charter you're looking at. But essentially, and you can see on page three, which is where you really will see the beef of what I think would be best here, is it's all in green there. It would have three very simple paragraphs, appointment and duties. Um, this one, there's a couple different options. I mean, we could propose something to the voters where the city administrator makes the appointment with advice of council or with advice and consent of council or whatever we think would be best strategically or best for the city public policy wise but i think the main goal here would be shifting it from a mayoral appointment to the city administrator appointment just because inherently what i do is really not observed by the mayor day to day and frankly by charter it's not so um just the way we're set up and the way we actually practice we all thought pretty much unanimously that it makes much more sense with consistency to have the city administrator be sort of the leading person on selection of the city attorney <laughs> with or without council involvement, really kind of up to you guys. Um, what I've drafted on page three is really just a proposal of what I think would be the best. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, this one is relatively straightforward. Um, performance review details like that, I think we should absolutely handle by ordinance if that were something we wanted to add on. For instance, duties of the city attorney are already in ordinance, not charter. So we could add to that by code. And what I'm proposing on page three would be just the absolute maximum that I would propose to put in the charter on it. So I think we're going to do questions at the end mostly. So if you have questions or thoughts, probably ideal to just go ahead and jot them down and we can address them all at the end. <clears throat> all right, question two, shall the charter of the city of Republic section 3.2 subsection C 14.2 subsection A and 14.2 subsection B be amended to change the terms of council members to staggered four-year terms with elections on even years. So I underline that on your handout. That is the only change that would be made to that part is just to clarify even years because as we have seen over the past four years, the back-to-back -back and then no election for two years hasn't worked out perfectly for us. So I have mapped it out on here. <laughs> Hopefully the visual will help you understand it because explaining it isn't always easy. So I've grouped you into two different groups. This is based on who is in the seat currently. This is not in any way saying that that's what anybody's gonna sign up for um, at the election when we do sign ups next month. But group A, so Franklin, Wilson, Updike, Neal, and Russell are all in that section. So those are the seats that expire next year and have a four-year term per our current charter as it is. Group B would be Gerke, um, Mr. Campbell who just joined us, Fields and Garlic. They will have a one-year appointment or a one-year election next year due to their appointments. Um, what I am proposing to do on this one to just make it simple is for 2024 we follow what we have to do with the charter as it is. So four-year terms for group A and one-year terms for group B. 2025 we do a second one-year term for group B and then in 2026 we give them the four-year term and from that point on will be four-year terms every even year and that will clean it up for the, all future references so that will also help with appointments and everything I will say the only appointment that would have fallen on a 2022 election if we had had it would have been the seat that Councilmember Gerke filled so most of the um, most of the people that have left have left since that election. <clears throat> Hopefully that made sense, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, question three, shall the charter of the city Republic section 3.6 C be amended to clarify that a vacancy in the council shall be filled for the remainder of the unexpired term, if any, at the next regular municipal election 
and again I underline <coughs> with expiring council seats on the ballot this is a question that we have taken multiple times over the past few years when we are filling a seat um, so this just makes it very clear this is how we've been doing it um, this is how we have had three attorneys explain is the way the, the charter reads um, but this just makes it clear for council and for any citizens did you have anything Additional yeah. To add. Um, yeah. So just to explain a little bit. So as you can see here, we're only proposing to add it's five or six words there at the end there and underline the question that we get. Uh, my office has gotten it. I know both city attorneys before me have also gotten it. And it's a good question is what does it mean to be at the next regular municipal election? So what we see with the four year terms is if a mayor makes an appointment six, eight months into a four year term. The question essentially becomes, well, how long does that mayoral appointed person as opposed to elected stay in that seat? Is it till the next regular municipal election six months from now, or is it the next regular municipal election where we have council members being elected? And that's really the distinction. That's the foundation for the question that's been asked for years. Um, I came to the same conclusion as prior attorneys that it is intended to mean the next regular election where we have elected bodies on the ballot. And so this is intended simply to clear that up as simply and concisely as possible. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to put this on this ballot just because of its um, slight relation to question two. Um, and I think it's overdue. So um, I, I would recommend we put this on there. We did give a second option just in case um, council has a preference on that to set a one or two year term limitation for appointed council members. Um, if question two passes, it would not exceed two years anyway. So it may be moot, but just in case, we don't ever wanna make one of these proposals contingent upon another. So we put this on here as an option, if that's your preference, um, we can switch it over to that. But it just puts some limitations on there in case there's any question on that as well. <coughs> Okay, proposed question number four. Shall the Charter of the City of Republic, section 3.10, subsection F and G, be amended to allow for the first and second readings of proposed non-emergency ordinances to occur in a single open council <coughs> meeting if approved by the council? <coughs> Megan's gonna cover this, but just to be clear, the wording on this is not final, so this will probably change before you would hear this at a first read. Yeah, so we're working on the wording to try to make it even more simple than that. So far, that's really as simple as we've been able to come up with while still being fair and accurate. Um, this essentially would allow for more flexibility in the procedures that council currently follows for adopting ordinances. As you guys all know right now, at least a week has to elapse between first and second read that goes for every single ordinance unless it is an emergency. So whether it is simple, whether it's something like a final plat, which comes up a lot, where actually the governing body really doesn't have discretion to refuse that as long as it is consistent with the preliminary plat and met the requirements. For instance, right now we're still doing a first and a second read on two separate meetings for those. So what we're proposing here, that would address situations like that. Um, certain types of ordinances, I do not recommend um, defining groups or categories of ordinances that would fit within this in a charter. Um, I, I just I would not recommend that for various reasons. So what I think would be best, and there's a lot of text in the slide, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> this is the best way Laura and I could come up with to just give you the four sentences that we've tried to narrow it down to, to try to simplify this as much as possible, to just present to you what the new procedure would be. Four sentences there, in and out, that's the entirety of the new procedures that we would be proposing. Essentially, what it would do is it would allow for this body to vote yes by affirmative vote of everybody present, so whether there's five, six, seven there that night, if Andrew presents an ordinance, for example, for first read on that day, he could ask that that be placed for second read on that evening. Under this new procedure, the council would be able to decide whether or not they wanted to go forward with that. They would have to hold a vote, and if six of six there said yes, we're okay with doing the second read on that night, then we could move to a second read. Ordinances would still be read twice. So yes, they would be read in the same meeting. First read, then we would have citizens <coughs> able to comment and council discussion. That would close. Second read, which of course only council discussion at that point, move to final vote. You can see in the rest of the sentences there, we've etched out a few different exceptions here, um, which includes consent agenda, because we get a lot of questions about, well, what about consent agenda items? This is all designed to address that. 
um, we ha carved out sort of a narrow category of the things that could be read on second read and approved for final passage on the consent agenda. What we're basically saying is if we print the title on the agenda as a consent agenda item, the charter, the new charter language would say that printing, that publication of the title as a consent agenda, that shall meet the reading requirement that's already established in the charter. So we don't mess with much of what's already in the charter. We just add these four sentences to it. So um, I'm sort of expecting some questions on this at the end. So I'm well, I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna jump in here for just a practical application so I can put this into context. At the last meeting, we had a tower lease ordinance <clears throat> that was not a material thing. That was like it, it had to wait for a second read. That it could have been done that same night because there was no opposite. It's on our property. We're the actual tenant of the property, and so that's an ordinance that would be in under this provision would be on the consent agenda. Could be on a consent agenda if passed. At any time, a council member could still, just like on any consent agenda, could ask to have it withdrawn and discussed. So there would not be there still be full transparency, but there would not be like a consent agenda for like say the trail where you've got contested issues where you got public comment, but just on some of those more smaller items that require two readings like the tower lease a small amendment that was timing was of the essence but we had to wait for another read to do that ordinance and there's so you sit there and watch a lot of these ordinances go by the meetings there's no additional comment there's no additional work that goes into them and so it's kind of like i think it would just expedite the process but still have the full transparency and your ability to withdraw it from the consent agenda yeah, that's good. And that's a good point. I'm glad he adds that because this it would, wouldn't eliminate the Roberts Rules Department procedure. So anybody would be able to pull it without a vote. Just remove it from the consent agenda. Any one of your requests. So um, with that, I think we should. We'll move on to question five now. Let Just me throw in. Numbers. This yep. is what Springfield and Joplin are doing. So I have actually included the script that Springfield <laughs> uses to help understand the consent agenda piece of it. So she will ask them, you have the opportunity to pull it from the consent agenda prior to the meeting. So once you read the agenda and you're like, I don't want this on the consent agenda, I can remove it immediately and put it onto the normal part of the agenda. You will also, in their process, she asks council and asks the people in the room if anybody wants to pull anything prior to a vote. So. There, that would be specified closely in the code changes that would correspond with it. So um, that's also included in your materials. And there's a lot of Springfield and Joplin um, references in your packet just for reference in case you have questions on how they do it. I might add for the final plat scenario, we need a counter on occasion. <clears throat> like when we bring that to you, they've completed all of the infrastructure, all the roads. So at that point, they're ready to build homes, but legally we can't allow them to sell the lot or build the home because the lot doesn't exist until you accept that final plat. If, they, if that timing is off, you know, depending on what our meetings are, there may be a 30 plus day period where they're just sitting with a subdivision that's complete that they can't do anything with. It. And what our developers are saying in the market environment that we live in, it's important to move as fast as possible so that we get a lot of requests about expediting Thank you, Andrew. All right, proposed question five, shall the charter of the City of Republic section 7.6 be repealed and a new subsection 7.3 subsection F be added to make capital planning part of the annual budget? Um, you just heard the capital improvement plan at our last council meeting on Tuesday. Um, this is what brought up adding this to it is it's not a huge part of our budget process right now. It's just a box that we're having to check. And so as it is like you're seeing every vehicle that's being purchased, it's very minute. What this would do is take away the capital improvement plan that you would approve by resolution, move it to the annual budget, and then we would specify the larger projects that would be covered under the capital improvement plan as part of the budget. So pieces of this would also be clarified in the financial policies that we could amend after this would be approved um, but it would just make it more valuable for staff time there's a lot of time that's taken up in doing this that doesn't bring a lot of fruit to us so i know david has opinions on this i, <clears throat> I do because i'm 
those that are very familiar, if you haven't heard me use the term wastewater uh, before, uh, if this was actually working, then the water towers, the wastewater plant, those those capital improvements uh, would have been done. I did dissolve the, ask the mayor to dissolve the capital improvement committee in 2019 because the staff was going into a room justifying buying vehicles, buying lawnmowers, and that's what we're paid to do already is to make those decisions and provide those those targets. What this is about, and what Bob brought up even on Tuesday night, uh, our finance director, was that we need a much more robust plan that it's not it's on a much larger scale. Fire Station Three, the wastewater plant, the future of the way. I mean, not just now, but what's it look like 20 years from now? So we've got 20 year master plans for water, wastewater, street, stormwater. How are we going to pay for those things? So having a meaningful capital improvement plan versus having something like Laura said it best. I think it's if it wasn't checking boxes, uh, like for years, I don't think the wastewater plant or water system would have been so far behind. But I think that cleaning this up and making it more practical in the actual budget process is, is significantly easier and better for staff. And I think it'll be a better product for the citizens long term, long after this where our tenures are over, it's I think we'll leave a, a legacy of plans that actually mean something and funding strategies or ideas for how to take care of the, the larger ticket items versus whether Jared needs to buy a, a mower for the parks department to mow the grass. So that's kind of, uh, that's the gist of, the, of, that, of that question. All right, for question <clears throat> six, shall the charter of the City for Public, section 10.3, be repealed to remove temporary right-of-way access and permitting for public utilities by ordinance to allow for permitting to be administratively managed according to the municipal code chapter 515. Um, this is another one that you recently heard and passed was the 515 amendments. Um, we are not and have not since this passed in 2019 done a right of way by ordinance. It's all done through the builds department. So this just muddies the waters on how we should do things if we have two different procedures. We have a code procedure and then we have this option. Um, Andrew had a, a theory, probably right, that it had to do with small cell wireless that was happening at that time um, and fear that it might have caused a lot of issues. Um, but I think with our code changes, we have everything we need to be able to take care of our right-of-way access I don't know, do you have any input that you want to add? Yeah, I would just say that, <clears throat> number one, you don't want all that because we issue a lot of right away permits. But <clears throat> regardless, if I brought everyone to you, it still would go through the same administrative process and permitting through the, the bills department. It has to be the way it's written in our municipal code. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that we can monitor that process. Um, I really think thinking back to small cell if you were here for that we beat that to death because it was the next bad thing in the universe and we we went and endeavored in legal process and discussion and I've issued maybe three of those in the entire city since it was conceived and really the cellular providers have gone away from that so I don't think that this is necessary like more. no I mean I just remember, I was, I was gashing over the small cell wireless legal. Anyway, continue. <laughs> that is all of the questions that we are proposing to take to the voters. There we we go. did have three additional ones, and I think David was going to cover I was, the gist of that. So, I, number one, Laura and <clears throat> Megan, again, I, I cannot thank you enough for all the work that you pulled together. That's very 23 minutes to pull through that just to get it out there for discussion. Uh, but these were three other ones that we had talked about was a procedure. Obviously, we've handled this in, uh, for excusing council member absences. Our charter is very clear uh, on one area that says if you miss more than three, you forfeit your seat. But then there's this language that talks about unless you're excused by council. Uh, <coughs> considering there were six questions already, well, this is something that we believe that we can draft by ordinance um, or add some language. I believe it's in your packet as well. And maybe it's not, but we discussed it. I know Laura and Megan and I did, uh, as creating an ordinance for what that procedure would look like in the future. Because you know, we, we had two of those this year. We, we, we addressed this twice in one calendar year. And I've been doing this for 31 years, and I've never I've been in this arena for a while. 
and I've never seen where how that was to be done. And I know we had a lot of conversation. What's the right way? And following the charter, that so that is not being included as a question. And then the other the other question we talked about was at large council seats. This is something that I'm familiar with, um, where you don't have where you have potentially four wards and then four at larges. There's there's pros and cons to that. But again, this was something else that. I believe would be at a later charter amendment that we're not granted it's it's up for your consideration but when the mayor and i whenever or the staff put out uh, solicitations for uh open positions or sometimes you have one person that'll apply for a vacant position like in the situation we had this last time we had eight so sometimes it's like hard to get certain wards to actually participate and that would be the reason for potentially having at large council seats and then uh, still have ward representation but again, it's not on this uh, on this actual on these questions. And then the last one was the ability to hire outside legal counsel. As it stands right now, this law, this charter amendment is or charter guideline has been it's been I don't know how to describe it. It's like there's different opinions on whether I can go out and hire it. Like so, if, if we get a notification from an attorney, hey, you're being uh, being sued, or hey, I, or we got a problem in employment law or environmental law. The way it's been communicated to me is that I have to go into executive session, ask for permission to pursue additional legal counsel with consent versus when time is of the essence running your own business, you would say, hey, listen, I'm going to hire, I'm going to call an attorney. I, I cannot technically do that right now. We have to wait for the next council meeting to come in here and say, can we get a not to exceed amount? That's something I think we could draft up by ordinance and actually get to the same, like you could delegate that authority, I believe by ordinance is what we discussed. So. Those are not being considered for the um, for the questions, but those three things have been discussed for additional work that you're probably going to see other than the at-large council seats because that's a full-fledged charter amendment. The two questions on this that would have an ordinance that is in your supplemental <coughs> materials in your packet. Um, if you want all of the information for the three, um, for when we were looking at potential charter changes, I can send you that separately. Um, we just wanted to present what we were actually proposing instead of getting too confusing with adding everything in there. So um, ask me if you um, want a copy of that later. Um, so adult use marijuana sales tax. Um, Amendment 3 was passed by the state voters on November 8th of 2022, allowing the adult use of med marijuana as opposed to just medical marijuana. Um, this allowed us 3% um, sales tax for municipalities and um, a lot of cities, 187 according to the list that MML provided us, that's at your seat. Um, there were a lot that have already passed it and it's been passing very well. Um, so it's gone over well by the voters. Um, we have to give a pretty vague estimate of how much this would actually generate because we do not want to disclose sales tax numbers for any given business. Um, but we're going to just put it at 100,000 to 200,000 and have it, it could grow as the city grows and potentially adding more dis, um, the dispensaries, excuse me. Um, so the, the number can change, but the benefit of doing this tax as opposed to some of the others is it only impacts people who are buying recreational marijuana. If you are, if you have a prescription for marijuana and you're using it medicinally, that would not tax them, only recreational. So this doesn't impact every citizen in this town. It also would be imposed on people from other towns. We have quite a few cities around us that do not have a dispensary. So um, that would allow the money to be coming from other cities as well as just our citizens. Um, so I came up with a couple of things that the money would go into the general fund. It would not be specified to any particular thing, but some of the things that we could use it for would be a couple of police cars per year. We could use it for, I, Andrew thankfully gave me a nice little estimate. For $100,000, we could do overlays for a mile of streets. So think about how far that could go for us. Um, we could do it for capital improvements, outreach, we want to leave it broad because we don't know what our needs are going to be in the future. So this would just allow us to um, use it as needed and evaluate it every budget season. Um, does anybody have any additional input on that one that you want to share, Megan? <clears throat> so essentially, this is just so if this passes, this would allow 
a dispensaries in the Republic to add on an additional 3% tax to recreational marijuana purchases only, all of which would go to the city. There is litigation out there currently that I'm aware of that you might have seen. Um, it is a challenge to what the counties are doing where they're trying to stack. That litigation is not call into question the municipality's abilities to add on 3% extra, which is very, very clearly allowed. Um, by language of Amendment 3. So even if litigation like that were to come up, I would have absolutely zero concerns. So that is only challenging the county's ability just to do what they're doing right now. So I just want to note that. So just to clarify, Megan, point. when you say stack, that'd be like Green County issuing three, going to the voters for 3 <coughs> cent or 3 percent, and then the city stacking one on top of that. That's correct. They're correct. The county is trying to say, well, they're entitled to a, a total of six also, and not just three, which would total six. So, and they, it, it didn't help, but they didn't. They did sort of an about face. I think in the beginning they were not going to do that, and then really quickly after enactment of the amendment, they sort of changed and came up with an opinion that they um, mailed out by letter to all the cities, notifying them that they would be doing that. And then we see the litigation. So we'll see where that goes. There's no ruling in the litigation, but that is being challenged right now, and it would not impact this charter amendment or if it were to pass the imposition of the actual extra three percent by any of the dispensaries in town that would be doing it under the new amendment. So. All right, we can take questions at this point. Um, I don't know if we just want to go in order of the question or. Can I talk about what we were just talking about? Yes, oh, please. All right. All right, so stick with me on this because I may be <laughs> way wrong and I'm going to need you to correct me. All right, let's talk about Amendment 3 and the 3% sales tax. If I were a business owner that owned a <laughs> marijuana dispensary, and I was looking for some place to go to, like I was actively looking to open a business to sell marijuana, I would want to potentially go where the sales tax is the lowest, right? That saves money. I can sell it for more and keep more of it. So by voting to put this on the ballot and raise sales tax, are we dissuading those businesses to come to town? So I think that's a good question. I think did the, that make sense to everybody? Yes. Like, the people yeah. follow my logic? Here. Like, if we yeah. vote yes, or, oh, thanks. I got you. Thanks. Yeah. If we're voting yes on this to put this on, we're not necessarily saying we're pro marijuana or anti marijuana. What's the realistic impact? I think so. That's a good question, and you would see kind of just in recent. I say history. Obviously, this is less than a year, everybody, but in history, with all the other cities in the state that have passed this, you have seen some opposition by the current dispensaries with licenses that were converted where they were selling, but really it hasn't been an overwhelming opposition because I think I believe the overall consensus is they were all pretty much expecting this would happen. I also think that, and again, everything is really new, so it's, it's numbers may or may not be reliable, but generally speaking, the numbers that trend to say suggest that it's not dissuading buyers from purchasing because there are still rather few number of dispensaries overall in the state. So a lot, of, a lot of cities do not have any, and they won't have any until the first licenses that are issued, they're considered new licenses, not conversion licenses, in tw late 2024 and 2025. So neighboring cities, those, those types of issues, you still have people coming in to these cities with only one dispensary, maybe two, three tops, right? And they're making those purchases. On top of that, that's why we had that list printed from um, Missouri Municipal League that was um, updated as of today where it shows that 187 cities so far within less than a year have already passed this. So really it's very clear the trend is going to be that ultimately I would anticipate that almost every single city or taxing authority is going to have this unless it's actually voted down by the voters or they vote to eliminate it. Some but of I guess which you're going to do see not have generally everywhere. So, so sorry, go ahead. No. Yeah. There are some cities that have passed this and they don't have a dispensary at this time, but they have it in preparation for the potential of one in the future. So a slight follow-up question. Let's say I'm just completely anti-marijuana. No way, no how, I don't want to support it, don't want to think about it. A no vote to this, is that just passing up potentially 100 to 200 or at least 3% of sales tax income? Is it... I would say in your specific hypothetical for somebody who's anti, anti dispensary, any of this, I think that would just be, I, I think we could own that and make sure we try to control that misunderstanding. Cause I think that'd be reflective of a misunderstanding because of what Laura said when she opened, where this would only impact, this would only cost 
extra money to those who use recreational marijuana and it would benefit the city. And ultimately the idea is the citizens because this, that's the examples where if we had $100,000, for instance, from the tax, we could go to buy new police cars or pave their streets. So those non-marijuana users that are in op opposition to it, well, they might just get their street repaved at the expense of marijuana users. So I don't, if that makes sense, but I think that's a great question. I think you're gonna have some voters who make that understandable misunderstanding and make that vote, but to the extent we can control that and limit that, I think we do so in our literature. We're not trying to make it attractive to marijuana businesses. We're just trying to, if they're here, we're gonna capitalize on it. Correct, 100%. And it's, right. it's in line with what the amendment allows us to do. I mean, it very clearly says, this shall be allowed by municipalities. And, and so. Mr. Mayor, sure. so <clears throat> also back to the 3%, <clears throat> that was negotiated with the lobby that was working on the constitutional amendment. So listening to the speaker, the, the, the individual that worked on that ballot on behalf of the advocates was the advocate for that, that worked on it. It was negotiated amongst the distributors. I think that there was a, that language was agreed upon that the, they knew they were gonna be paying some level of tax. I think there was, and I'm maybe wrong, but in different states, it's actually higher than just 3%. I think they can go up to five or 6%. <laughs> so I think they, that was negotiated to uh, a 3% with uh, the, the sellers, distributors. Mr. Mayor, I had a question. How many dispensaries do we have in Republic? One. one. Just one. Just one. <laughs> so this tax would be specific to one business, one product. What's the current tax rate that they pay before this, if, if we were to put this on the ballot and this passes, what's the tax rate today? 9-1. Yeah. 9-1, and that's the only tax that they pay? They yes, don't they pay don't. an additional tax on top of that? No, they would pay an additional 3%. If this was to go to the voters, and it'd be 12-1. 12 one total if this goes to the voters if it passes if it passes the voters if it passes to the voters you said 12.1 percent yeah and, I, okay. and one thing I, I believe is i also <laughs> i don't believe you can get dispensaries just based upon is, is based upon the size of the community so there is there are some parameters as to how many dispensaries you can actually have in your community so yeah. so I'm, I'm definitely going to need to clarify that on the percentage of uh, some of the information that's been relayed to me from the public was a little bit conflicting on that so i just wanted to make sure that that percentage was correct our base sales tax rate is 9.1 percent so obviously if you choose to buy that's that's state rate. and ours combined totally. state and count state combined. county okay. and yeah. city so was there an additional six percent adult use tax that was on top of that already within that formula no no an, an, an adult use tax an additional adult use so i didn't have a lot of time to do all my research on this i've never heard of an adult clear. use tax so adult adult use tax is that's basically just what amendment three calls this so it's the <laughs> phrase that they've called it is adult use marijuana that's the same thing as recreational marijuana but what the legislature decided to call it so um and that additional six percent i don't i'm not sure because i'm not i'm not sure what they've been asking. this is just it bottom. could refer to what the county is trying to do this is based upon a um, receipt from the the one dispensary that we've confirmed the has been for the, the republic and so on yeah and it could be i mean i could look at it if you want me to but that could be what the county is currently trying to do where they're trying to add on that extra tax but i would have to look at okay. it to see i was just verifying that i kind of put currently from what i was told at 15.1 and then with this addition at three percent at 18.1 percent so that I just need yeah. a verification and my apologies I haven't had a lot of time to go over this either, yeah so. well and that's what we're here for I mean the good news is it's not on the agenda it's just something for us to to find those things out so I mean we'll dig some more but I I don't even know where that six percent would come from I think that's a state tax a state that's an addition mm -hmm. and I saw some stuff but I didn't just have time to go through and, and right. clarify everything mr. mayor sir how is marijuana defined for this? Good question. So it's very, very lengthy. It's in the text of Amendment 3. It's probably 38 lines. Okay. Um, it really, it includes any, almost anything you can think of that you can put the intoxicating portions of the THC plant into. So, I mean, if you think of edibles, I think the, the things like CBD have, wouldn't necessarily be included if CBD it doesn't have a THC content. is not included because it does not have the intoxicating properties. So THC is tetrahydrocannabinol. I really butchered <laughs> no, that. I apologize. That was really close, actually. Was I? Yeah, okay, I've read it on text, but I don't yeah. often say the word out loud like that. So 
Um, I think it, it is basically anything you can put that into. That is my trying to be concise layperson definition. But the text of Amendment 3 is super lengthy. It lists out almost everything you can think of. But it would not include CBD, all the other CB, whatever letter after that. Those are not included unless they're mixed with THC or the other intoxicating. So are we pulling from Missouri's definition then, or how is that what our, mm -hmm. okay. Yes, we would. Yeah, we would, just to be safe, anything that we would, and anything we would enact by code too, just the same as we did with the changes we made to, for instance, our criminal code sections that penalize the possession or use of it, we would track with the language of Amendment 3 always to be consistent. So it would be, if we defined it, which I wouldn't recommend necessarily in the charter, but code afterwards, yeah, we would use their definitions. Gotcha. Sure. Mr. Mayor. Sir. Um, so uh, this goes into the general fund, and that, that's just kind of a little bit of concern. How do we as a council, how do we ensure there's accountability on that, that, that you know, we can say it goes to two police cars, street improvements and capital improvements. How do we as a city council hold accountability for those funds going to those without it, with it just rolling into the general fund? Well, there are all, other those are examples, so oh, yeah. that's not yeah. tying us to those. Those are examples of what we could use the money sure. for. So if we had a different example, how would we ensure that example was held accountable? What we could do is have it as a separate fund and report it out through our budget. Yeah, we could do it several well, different ways. Hold on. What, what you would do is you'd go into the admin budget, just because if you look at the admin budget, uh, it has all of our sources of revenue, and it'd be outlined right there. And then and when you're doing the budget and doing, Bob's submitting the capital outlay, that's how you would hold accountability. It's listed. It's not going to be just blended in there. It, it would just, be separated as a separate line item. Yeah. Three percent marijuana. Yeah. Tax. So, like, if if you look at the fire, if you look at the fire department budget. It says cigarette tax. It's sure. Weird. I don't know what, but it's outlined in the revenue line item, and so it would be outlined in there. And so you would see, so just, just when you're approving the budget in general, that it's not just getting do our due diligence to make sure that that amount was accounted for in some of those projects in the budget. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it, and that's what I think. It could be used for the park. I mean, it could be as well in that capacity. But right now, what I would tell you is we're $50 million short on a wastewater plant, so I like to see the police cars and streets. But if we don't get additional funding from the state, I can tell you where our first recommendation is going to be where it goes. So and that could get tied up for a while. Yeah, and I will add something. But, I mean, it's a good question. Oh, I'm sorry. But what I would just say that if you look at the fire department budget, it would look just like that. It'd just say recreational tax, marijuana tax. And how much it generates. I just wanted to add to the the purpose that we have that in there really the the focus at least from our perspective is to make sure we draw that distinction because there is some confusion because the state is not entitled to do that just the same as us so we as municipalities are unique there's an important distinction there the state tax funding the state receives is restricted by constitutional amendment three so I mean they have to use it for I think, the veterans the fund veterans the public staffing. defender service mm -hmm. We, specifically municipalities, are unrestricted in our use. That's very clear. And so I think the voters should know that, that we're different than the states, because I'm sure that a lot of them will have heard that. Sure. So it's important for us to include that in there. But yeah, some clarification on our part, for sure. We could address that, and of course, with David's sure. budgetary. And, Hold and, on. We'll go down here, and then we'll go. Sorry. Well, if his is a follow-up, you may want to. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Mine was kind of going along with what the mayor was asking, kind of a two-part. Do we know what kind of outlook there is for additional dispensaries to come to the city? And then with that, kind of opposite of what he was saying, would we want to make this slightly lower than everybody else to make ourselves more appealing for a business to come to? So, like a 275, for instance, just to be yeah. honest. So I think I that's that's an interesting suggestion. That's actually a really cool <coughs> suggestion. I will say I don't I haven't drilled down into the list of 187. I will be I was shocked if anybody's done anything other than three, so we would be an outlier. Not saying that's a bad thing, but um, the to to your first point though, um, I think, and I I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. You asked about the timeline for the I can right answer because this. I know that there's more. So it, it, Andrew can the, yeah. There's a specific wait. You want to handle that yeah, one? Yeah, on me? licensing okay. because that comes through us. I would just tell you from our perspective because there's a lot of regulation on geography, number of dispensaries <laughs> per uh, constitutional like district in the state, like. Our outlook is like it's highly unlikely that we would see additional dispensaries unless there's a substantive change to the rule and regulation of, of where they can go. I mean, would you, Chris, would you somewhat agree with that, with our kind of the way our city's laid out? There's a very limited, we've, we've got a map that we've produced in the past based on uh, what we adopted as our restrictions, and there is 
truly a pretty limited amount of places where they can go. I mean, especially with the school not purchasing additional property. So that's, you're talking about the demarcation points, which is a good point. So physically speaking is what they're speaking to, but beyond that, in addition to that, the amendment sets out very specific timelines for when this when there can be any licenses issued by the state. So the state is essentially appropriated a certain number of licenses it can give. There were conversion license, which is what the existing dispensary that's been here in Republic is. They were automatically converted on a set timeline. After that, you have specific licenses that won't be authorized until 2024, then the next date after that is 2025. And so again, at best, the earliest they would see an application would be under the timeline that is set in Amendment 3, which is out quite a ways. So just to add to their demarcation points. Mr. Updike, you had a question. Who would be overseeing the, the businesses? Would it be the, the, the states, uh, uh, county, or us overlooking like overlooking them, make sure they are doing everything by the book? Oh, they're permitted by the state. That's not something that, I mean, we, we issue the permit, but we're, we're not the enforcing, we just issue the business license. So, I mean, all the regulations and rules that they have to follow, they're governed by the state and how they even have their license in general. Uh, I've got Mr. Wilson, then I'll go back to Mr. Frank. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Okay. <clears throat> to me, it's pretty obvious that the only people it's going to affect is the person buying the product, the owner of the establishment. It's not going to be in his pocket. He just has to, I guess, do the bookkeeping. There, and, and and Mr. Mayor, that's that's kind of uh, it's going to be one of my biggest hurdles that I'm going to have to cross in this is the fact that it does seem so predatory and it's going after right now one business in town that sells a particular product. Everything that we can put on here as you know justification for passing that tax, I mean, we could fit in a number of things in there. I would agree with. The biggest hurdle I'm going to have is is approaching this for it's a new tax to a business that I understand we can do that, but it's very difficult to. I mean, we're taking this money from other people, and you know, this is probably their movie money. You know, I don't know what percentage of their income that is. I just I feel really unfair about this, and the fact that even though we can do this, and if we decide to do this, we're taxing one business in town right now. I understand there could be more into that in the future, but this just feels it feels icky to me, just in that sense of I'm not saying I agree with marijuana use or what they're doing. It's just I mean, this kind of sets a precedent. I understand law keeps law keeps us from just adding taxes where we want but at the same time uh, this is it's tough for me even since all of these cities have passed it obviously there's uses that we can use for it but we're going after a single product on a single business in town and that's really it's going to be a tough hurdle for me to cross yes sir so i uh every november we launch christmas music on one of our stations and i spend the first like three weeks of the month just answering messages of people who are angry <laughs> <laughs> that, there's, that there's Christmas music on. People are very angry uh, right now. Um, and my response has not changed. It is just don't listen to it then. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to address Mr. Franklin's point, I don't think we're taxing a business I think we're taxing the people and their preferred form of relaxation. And I don't see any difference between it on the taxation side than cigarettes. If you don't want to get taxed on cigarettes, don't smoke. If you don't want to get taxed on weed, don't buy weed. And, and to me, I, I don't see the distinction. That's all. That's what I'm saying. Sure. Matter of principle. What's the procedure here? Let's say we decide we want to go forward with this. Is it, this is something that we present to the voters, right? Yeah, I mean, you're not, yeah. like we've said with all of our ballot measures, <clears throat> all we're asking is to put it before the, the community to make that decision. And, and again, when you say, I want to clarify, it says we're imposing this. We as a staff aren't imposing this. We're, we're presenting, which is what we're to do. Sure. So I just want to be clear on that, that we ourselves, um, are bringing the opportunity of what if, and then for your consideration, and it's up to your vote. So what this will be will be on an ordinance. Uh, we have a timeline, as with all the charter amendments as well, to be on the April ballot. It would require a vote in December and then the first reading in January, and that would comply with us being on the April ballot. So there's still two reads of this ordinance that would have to take place before 
the consideration and again it's just to take it to the voters this body is not voting on anything other than to present it before them sure and i mean at that point let's say that if we didn't if we decided not to do that we still have that on the table to use in the future let's say that we ended up in a position where we absolutely had to have additional revenue we could still go to that to have that revenue versus maximizing that and using that now as, as if that makes sense. It's something like a 3% in savings that we could always approach in the future if we needed to to cover the cost of something we weren't able to. Well, I mean, I think if you look, oh, I, I would agree, but I, I'm not going to, I can't really advocate, but to educate, I think we've demonstrated in the budget and with the street fund and the things that have not been done that there there's a need now that there's a funding shortfall that those funds could be used for. So we, it's not like, if, if, if it was the best case scenario, if we could do an extra mile, considering that we haven't funded streets prior to the public safety ballot measure passing for 10 years prior, I'd say that there's a big need now and for, I'm those, definitely, for those projects. Definitely need to but, look at our other taxes and what we have allowable as in capacity of the other taxation that impossible. I'm, I'm just looking into the future, you know, kind of a worst case scenario, so I don't mean to be dramatic. I'm just kind yeah. of looking at capacity of what we have in the future for revenue if we should need additional revenue. So let me do this, as our goal is to keep this meeting to an hour. Uh, not very many of us were on council whenever we did our last charter amendment. So let's talk about the procedure, what the steps are, what our duties are up here as city council members. What it, does it look like between now and April? What do we need to be doing? And what considerations should we be taking? Does that make sense? Yeah, I believe between now and the next, between now and the December, is it 12th meeting? Yes. I think between now and December 12th would be to present more questions or questions regarding the charter because Laura and Megan have done a great job of how that they would present these questions to to the voters or at least information that would go out um, but I would like to have the feedback as to any of the questions that are on there and anything that would like to be added or and if there's something on the, that you'd like to see changed in the charter that we've not discussed um, we'd kind of like to know what that might be as well but uh, we believe just based upon um, what we presented, we can answer any questions that are there. That's pretty much just become informed on the questions. So between now and December 12th, become informed on the questions. December 12th, we're going to have a first read. That's right. We will have opportunity for citizen participation, participation just like we do with any other first read. Uh, and then we will have a second read at, in January. For, yeah, that would be the second read, and that would be the... And that would be the deadline that we'd have to meet just to meet the April ballot. So in that dis January, we, we would vote yes or no, do we put it on the ballot on each individual question, I would imagine. That is right, each question. And then it, we would be presenting that to the voters in April. That is correct. And you bring up a very valid point. Each of these, because they're on the, their own question, I believe, I believe those may have to be are those separate ordinances. They were all in one last time. And I'm that was... I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. It's just you're right on my question right now. Yeah. That was one of my challenges last time, was just the fact that it was so complicated uh, without being a complex of amendments and whatnot. I voted against that from what I remember right, and I, re I voted against it from my reasoning from what I remember was just because there were portions of that that I didn't agree with. It wasn't all. Right. Yeah, so my recommendation is going to be that we separate them this year to to avoid I would agree. time sure. to avoid that, because that's not yeah, it yeah, doesn't put I'm the done. council members in a fair spot and like it kind of handcuffs you which is not what we want so i i will recommend that we even though it's tedious i think it's important that they're addressed individually sure so i that's appreciate gonna be it my recommendation. so it's incumbent on each of us up here mm -hmm. to become very educated about this ask staff questions and then most importantly talk to our citizens to see what they support what they don't support to decide if we want to present this to the citizens as a whole on the april ballot did we miss anything that we need to cover before the close of this meeting any questions from council? Oh. That, <laughs> that can be handled. Yeah. yeah, we can get Are we going to go back through the other amendments after we close the meeting? We, or? we, we can just, I mean, we can. I'll stay for an hour. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay for an hour to go. I have questions on other things, but I'm not opposed to closing, so we can wrap it up. And then, yeah, right. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I've got questions, too, that I could go on for a little bit, too. So Sure. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to close the meeting because some of us have obligations we have to leave for. Laura's going to be here for an hour. Megan's not going to go anywhere until everything's answered. Mm -hmm. And then we will also have an opportunity to do the exact same discussion, if need be, at the first read. And we can hash it out as long as we need to. This was merely an educational meeting. Sure. And with that, we will close this meeting. I thank the staff for their very hard work and excellent presentation. Have a good day.